I'm sure plenty of you are not new to YouTube videos and articles that are becoming increasingly critical of social media. And before you start smelling blood in the water, I'm not exclusively referring to how everyone's dunking on social media giants for making increasingly tone-deaf and dangerous moves that further trash their platforms. What I mean in terms of articles critical of social media, I'm referring to the cold turkey cliché where someone completely quits the habit of participating in it and goes on about how it radically changed their life. I have a unique problem with these depictions, not because they're unhealthy healthy suggestions, but rather because it's painted in a broad light that doesn't truly explain why it can be a transformative experience to distance yourself from social media. This lack of understanding leads a lot of people to make life hacks based on these depictions that eventually turn into shaky advice. Dopamine fasting could be considered one such example. The derivatives of simplistic or reductionist content itself becomes lacking in meaning to the point where it results in increasingly less useful information than the flawed original source. I point out this problem because it will be a key understanding I want to build by explaining my own personal journey with social media, which starts us off in my middle school years. Now, big disclaimer, I wasn't a cool kid. I, for heaven's sake, I write video essays for YouTube. Of course, I wasn't one of the popular kids. Anyways, because of this lack of social credit during my school years, different types of social media, such as Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter, didn't really appeal to me. My life just wasn't interesting enough to be posting about it on a regular basis, and I didn't like hyping up every mundane thing I did for social media because that seemed exhausting. With all of this said, I was not immune to social media, and my first real platform for it was in middle school. iFunny was the big one because it was good for that controlled, yet still satisfying dopamine rush. The platform was exclusively for sharing images, and some would get so popular that they'd get in the featured section, pushed to every user, which would be 20-something new images every few hours. The amount and timers changed as the platform aged. There were three different feeds on iFunny, Featured, Subscriptions, and Collective, which was just every new post on the platform. I started out with Basic Memes, Will Ferrell, the usual iFunny staples. Because I was still a conservative in middle school due to living in a red state and having conservative parents, I started to lean towards the politics side of iFunny. Looking back, it's embarrassing that the majority of my political knowledge at the time basically came from PragerU videos, right-wing iFunny memes that were mostly devoid of real information, along with those cringy feminist fail compilations. As I got older, I matured and learned that a bunch of Prager U videos and memes which equated to playground insults weren't going to win me any debates, and I lost plenty of casual political ones with opponents as easy as mildly educated liberals. iFunny was part of my political transition, and when I watched my first few BreadTube videos, that was the beginning of a big push to get me to consider the politics of the other side. There was a leftist side of iFunny, and the time they took to post statistics and write stupidly long essays they'd edited to one image created a stark contrast against all the right-wing memes that lacked any academic rigor whatsoever. Whatsoever. I still have immense respect for the people who took the time to not only debate the still-developing alt-right, mind you this was 2016, but also post those statistics and write long essays or rebuttals. I was learning a lot as a baby leftist because those who were part of the movement for a long time were dropping truth bombs left and right that honestly blew my mind. While many people with more clout than me were using social media for engagement and validation, my draw to it was this constant search for information, that itching curiosity that was answered in a format I could easily take in as a young Zoomer. This all made me feel as if a heavy veil was being ripped off my vision of the world, and the more deep dives into these statistics and essays I made, the more I realized that right-wingers were attempting to dissuade me from giving this information a chance by using lackluster memes which tried to paint leftist ideals as nonsensical and as such not worthy of the slightest consideration. Regardless, leftist iFunny was much more interesting than the constant drone of low-effort memes I used to be inundated with when I was still right-leaning. However, this and I hate to use such a term to explain anything that happened on iFunny, golden age of politics didn't last long. What a lot of those people who labored to write long essays and rebuttals soon learned was that the right wing was acting in bad faith. They were not interested in facts, and really only wanted to live in a bubble where their preconceived prejudices were not challenged since growing out of such primitive thinking to mature as a person is a painful process, and they're afraid of that. With this realization, a lot of those talented users left the platform, and to this day, I still miss them a little. They would have made excellent writers and video essayists. With the first leftists leaving the platform, there were holdouts who were convinced that leaving was a bad idea since it gave Nazis an uncontested platform. But as time went on, and straight-up Nazi memes made it to feature it was an inevitability that the lack of moderation and right-wing bias of the platform led to a fascist iFunnier, Samuel Woodward, murdering a gay Jewish classmate. This event not only led to a lot of FBI agents making really obvious comments trying to gather information that everyone made fun of, but it also led to a lot of holdouts, including myself, leaving the platform. 
I doubt it was going to stay much longer on iFunny anyways, and when I found that Reddit was full of communities that supplied the same articles, news, and statistics I was getting on iFunny, it became a sinking ship that was easy to leave. So, now we get to my days on Reddit, which certainly lasted longer than iFunny, as I was on Reddit for roughly four to five years. Reddit can be easily described as a less limiting experience than iFunny. There were political communities, arguably too many because leftists are terrible at handling infighting, along with markets for people to buy and sell hardware, and communities for every hobby you could think of. All this said, I had a pretty decent time on Reddit and was getting art and hobby content on top of all the stats and news I was normally getting on iFunny. Genuinely, there were few problems with Reddit for the longest time. I got my political content, I got the info I wanted from hobby forums, and shared my YouTube content around back when I believed that was still a good idea. Newsflash, it isn't. The problem with Reddit that pushed me to leave is once again politics related. Mind you, this is just a theory, so take it with a grain of salt, but the politics side of Reddit was starting to become very depressing and exhausting when Twitter was just starting to have its first batches of Elon-related problems that started shoving refugees to Reddit and Mastodon. Reddit, unlike Mastodon, made a grave mistake in that it didn't teach users to ditch their toxic Twitter ways when hopping platforms. Mastodon did this in stride, and would remind people to use content warnings, moderate their toxic behavior, and defederate instances that didn't do those things because users didn't want to deal with such nonsense. However, with Reddit these people blended in, and arguably brought a culture of alarmist political content to the platform that made its toll on my mental health monstrous. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but around the time the Twitter refugees started to migrate, I was getting less emotionally neutral statistics and useful articles, and immensely more reminders that a small and powerful minority of dipshits want me dead. Seriously, this got so bad that even left-leaning meme communities like R196, god I miss you wonderful bastards, had to make a new rule where bigoted posts could only be shared on Saturdays. I understand a lot of leftists like sharing bigoted content because they want more people to complain about it with, but there's a difference between sharing things to complain about and scrolling through subreddits you wouldn't realize aren't for Nazis until you check the title and realize such content is being posted there to be made fun of. Seriously, scrolling through r slash forwards from Clanma at times felt like reading Mein Kampf in public but shaking your head as you're doing it to signal to everyone you disapprove. On top of this, it was draining to see anti-cop subreddits go from a reasonable mix of videos, analysis, and opinions to just a constant doom-scrolling stream of videos depicting clearly non-violent civilians being brutalized and slaughtered in broad daylight. This shift in the emotional fervor on the politics side of Reddit led me to finally decide that I needed to greatly lessen my usage or I was going to end up lying down and rotting in my local ditch. That meant uninstalling Reddit from my phone and limiting my usage on the computer. What's ironic about this social media break is that not even a month after I made this decision, the Reddit CEO started making Twitter-esque decisions that would greatly damage the platform, along with saying things in leaked memos that showed a complete disregard for what the community felt was best for the platform. All the political stuff aside, which unfortunately I had to mention or else this journey between social media platforms makes no sense, we eventually get to my jump from Reddit to Mastodon. I'm not going to comment too much on my actual experience with the platform since I'm still pretty new there, but also because I want to elaborate on the point I made earlier in the intro. Unlike a lot of clickbaity videos about going cold turkey, my story is not that extreme. Mastodon is a downsize for me. I don't expect it to deliver on all the content I got from Reddit, and while I know Lemmy exists, I don't want it. I don't want Mastodon to deliver on all my needs because I was downsizing my social media usage anyways. If I can still get some political content, statistics, cute art, and cozy pictures, then I'll survive. What did this downsizing do to me though? Was I magically able to do all those things I was unable to do? Did I become superhuman and superior to all the zombified plebs scrolling infinitely through their feeds? No. First, I'd like to take the word dopamine out of your vocabulary. I know I used it once earlier, but, but please shut the fuck up about it. It's not important for this part. My life improved due to this social media downsizing because of a change in my behavioral patterns. And I'd like to use that phrase, behavioral patterns, instead of increasingly pop science words like dopamine that people love to shove around wantonly online. Anyways, uninstalling social media from my phone was a big first step. It's my belief that you should only own a smartphone if the convenience of carrying a basic camera, music player, telephone, and GPS in one device is appealing to you. A smartphone is not a distraction you can pull out when you're bored for more than five minutes, or something to look at immediately when you wake up, or something to scroll through when you haven't thought of anything to do with your lazy afternoon yet. Further downsizing my usage made it easier to check social media less. Reddit had basically an Infiniscroll design. Meanwhile, my Mastodon feed doesn't pull me into it as much since I can check most of the posts there in a matter of minutes, not hours. Granted, I don't follow a lot of people yet, but even then, individual accounts aren't near the insane amount of activity as entire subreddits. 
This rewired me to stop absentmindedly opening up an InfiniScroll feed when I got bored or couldn't think of something to do with my afternoon right away. It made previously mundane tasks a bit more fulfilling because I had a greater appreciation for making some kind of tangible progress in my life, regardless of whether it was engaging or not. I spent time organizing my files, working on my projects, or shamelessly taking a lazy afternoon to listen to music and play games instead of browsing social media. Hell, even if you don't have hobbies, playing some nice single player or indie games is immensely better for your mental health than InfiniScrolling. What all this extra time away from social media and behavioral pattern rewiring eventually did was make me more comfortable using social media to share my life. As I said earlier in the video, I didn't feel my life was ever interesting enough to share on social media or post about much, but because I have more brain space to do fun and interesting things, and because Mastodon doesn't pressure you to post frequently, unlike other platforms, it was easier for me to post now and then about my life or hobby things or whatever, really. That's a pretty huge change for me because for the entirety of my life, I was never comfortable doing this. I have a feeling that other people might feel the way I did, that they are too uninteresting for social media, because they've basically made it their hobby to watch other people do all the fun things. And that's kind of depressing. Mastodon is a nice platform to watch people do fun things because it feels more real. No influencers, no rich fucks pushing their lavish lifestyle in your face, no bullshit. It makes it easier to believe as a normie that you can be one of those cool people with five different ThinkPads running Linux, or that freak who collects esoteric music on spinny sound discs. My overarching point here is that it's better to look at corporate social media like an abusive relationship. Some people have convinced themselves that leaving such a toxic relationship and never engaging in another one is the healthiest choice. But I think for most people, they still want that relationship, but with a platform less toxic. This change won't make you a superhuman by any means, but life becomes a lot more interesting when you don't have a nagging void that's an app or browser click away that makes it more difficult for you to focus on boring tasks or think of better, simple ways to spend your free time.